eerie calm after that pumping music, eh? Uh, so, you guys have been staring at this for a few minutes, so I don't need to repeat, but for the video I will. This is DVO 207, not DEVO 207, uh, defending your workloads against the next zero-day attack. My name is Mark Nunnikoven. I'm the Vice President for Cloud Research at Trend Micro. You can catch me online on Twitter, MarkNCA, GitHub, pretty much any social community. Uh, that's my handle. Um, quick little bit of housekeeping, and then we're going to dive right into this. This is a sponsored session. It is not a sales pitch. I don't talk about anything sales pitchy. We have a great, really cool aviation-themed booth down in the Expo Hall in reInvent Central. Go check us out, uh, booth 1004. Uh, teams on site, they'd love to answer any questions, talk about our deep security platform, all that kind of stuff. But the goal here today is to learn. Okay, this is tagged as a 200-level session. Um, there's enough of us here that uh, as we're going along, if you're not quite uh, getting a concept, I try to keep this at the 200 level, but if there is something that's a little difficult to handle, make me a little sign somehow, and I will repeat whatever's going on, and we're going to be doing a good Q&A at the end as well. The goal here is to understand how security changes and has changed in the AWS cloud, because we can do a lot of really cool, new, exciting things but it takes new technology, which we have in the form of AWS cloud services, but it also takes a new approach, right? So what I want to start is kind of level set and show you some of the story and how things have evolved over time. This is the fourth reInvent. Um, I've been privileged to be here for all of them. Um, and this started where, at the first reInvent, we were talking about the new way of doing security in AWS cloud. And we were talking about the shared responsibility model. Everybody here, uh, I know you just had a snack, so I'm going to get you a little bit of audience participation. How many people know what the shared responsibility model for security is? Show of hands. Awesome. I am super happy about that because when we first introduced this in conjunction with AWS at the first reInvent, which was significantly smaller than this one, um, nobody knew. People were still trying to figure out. The common theme was, oh, AWS takes care of everything. And while they do a lot, they don't take care of everything. For so, those people who did not raise their hand about knowing what the shared responsibility model, I will give you the Coles Notes version, super, super quick. On one hand, AWS takes care of anything physical, infrastructure, networking related, or hypervisor, virtualization related. On the other hand, operating system, applications, data, and the configuration of AWS services is on you. So AWS takes part of it, you take part of it, that's why they call it the shared responsibility model. The easy way to remember how many responsibilities or how much responsibility you have directly for the security of any AWS service is to look at how many options there are to configure that service. So everyone's familiar with S3? Yeah? Okay, that one should have more shows of hands. You guys should all raise your hands for S3. Yeah, I'm going to keep bugging you. You're going you're gonna to get with it. Don't worry. So for S3, basically you set the permission of who can see the bucket, and that's it. Right? So very few options available for S3. So you don't have that much direct shared uh, responsibility for security. AWS takes care of the vast majority of that. Contrast that to something like VPC. VPC, you can define your subnets, your security groups, your routing tables, your NACLs, a whole bunch of configurations. Your VPN connects, your internet gateways, your NATing, all this kind of stuff. You have significantly more direct security responsibilities in a service like VPC. So shared responsibility model, you're balancing, sharing the responsibility of directly managing security with AWS. So we introduced this, we talked to AWS, we both brought this message out to the market about sharing the responsibility. That was way back in 2012 when this conference was 2,200 people, right? If you guys have seen CloudAbility has a fantastic uh, infographic about how this conference has grown. Um, it is just leaps and bounds. So the next year we came and we were talking and the, question, the questions we got around security were a little more mature. People started to get it. They started to talk more about security and compliance. And what was interesting was we had this change in the tenor of the discussion. It went from being predominantly should I go to more of when am I going into the AWS cloud. And what I really had fun at that conference in 2013 was because we got to talk about our experience about building a security service in AWS. And that was really us showing that we could do it and how you could build a highly, uh, highly available, highly secure service to deliver highly available, highly secure security to other people. Um, but then last year we got to talk about operations. And this is where this talk really starts to pick up is that we talked about how operations are shifting from a traditional security model. So how many people are, have heard of and are in both at the same time tired of the term DevOps? Everybody? Yeah. It's, it's handy, but it's also really, it's everywhere. It's kind of losing its meaning. But DevOps is actually a recognition of the fact that you can do operations very, very differently 
when it comes to the AWS cloud. Everything's available via an API, and you can start to think about your uh, IT assets in a different way. Compute all of a sudden becomes relatively disposable. And from a security perspective, that changes a lot of things, and that brings us to today. We're gonna talk about a bunch of AWS services and controls that you can layer on top of those services to deal with attacks like zero days. So, first of all, um, I, we're all adults here, so I, I will ask, and I will phrase this properly, um, I, if you disagree, raise your hand. Shit happens, you're gonna have to deal with it. Right, yeah. Everyone agrees with that statement? From a security perspective, that's the realization that regardless of how good you are at layering security and monitoring security, at some point you're gonna have to deal with a breach of some significance. This is a fact of life. I know that sounds weird coming from a security guy talking to you about security, but realistically you need to plan for it. If you fail to plan for it, that's when you fail at security. So what you have to do is build resiliency into your deployments. And that ends up being a very interesting concept when it comes to AWS, because it starts to get out of the core of what security is traditionally applied. So we like to say no a lot. We like to put controls in that stop people from doing fun stuff and we slow projects down. That no longer applies. You can't do that and be successful in the AWS cloud. So we have resiliency, which basically means stuff happens and you need some form of response to bring things back online. And ideally, that's an automated response. So with security, we tend to look at a security through a lens called CIA, not the agency CIA, but confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Unfortunately, availability is the one area that most security operations tend to ignore. Um, however, it is a really important aspect of security. If your data and applications are not available, well, then they're not of any use to your business, right? And the goal of security is to reduce the, business, the risk to the business, um, and availability is a big part of it, but when we tie back to DevOps, availability is a bridge builder because other areas, operations and development, are always concerned about availability. So we can use it and the concept of resiliency to go around because if a layer drops off your stack, if it was a configuration error or a security incident, the result is the same. You need to rebuild it to bring production back online or back to full capacity. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk uh, in that with the context of a zero day. So you guys, obviously you've watched TV, you see media, everybody's heard the term zero day, right? Yeah, a little bit nodding. Okay, that's good. What a zero day ends up being is it's a vulnerability that we know about that has no immediate remediation or long-term fix, so no patch. It's a problem now, we know it's a problem, but there's nothing we can do to long-term fix right now. Um, and what really, what a lot of people don't figure out is that it's an evolving situation. It's not just a, hey, here's a problem. It continues along. It's normally an entire process. And while you're dealing with this process, that means that you're not doing other work for your business, okay? And we're gonna use a practical example. So Shellshock was a very public vulnerability. It's one of my personal favorites. It's a fantastic story, and you're gonna see why in a few minutes here. Shellshock was a vulnerability that came out uh, in 2014. Um, it hit mainstream media, it was in USA Today, um, it was in Forbes, it was on the TV. Like, people were coming up to me as a security guy and saying like, hey, what about Shellshock? And I'm like, listen, mom, you don't need to really worry about it right now, but good that you are aware of these issues. Um, right, and it's, it was, last year was the, the uh, year of branding security vulnerabilities, so Heartbleed with the little heart with the menacing blood dripping from it, Shellshock with the turtle thing. But in a good aspect from security is that now it's a mainstream topic. So for your information, Shellshock was a bug in Bash. Bash is a command line interpreter that is almost everywhere. It's embedded in devices, um, in your home routers, it's in cars, um, everybody who's got a Mac and terminal, by default it boots up Bash, right? It's command line, you type it, it executes something. Very simple, very common way of accessing uh, computers, right? So, Bash, command line interpreter. This bug, Shellshock with vulnerability, was rated 10 out of 10 or 1010 from the National Vulnerability Database. That means that it was extremely widespread, because Bash is everywhere, and it was extremely easy to exploit. And it was so easy, in fact, that I will break my normal code and I will show you actual attack code on the screen, because it's ridiculously easy. This is the attack code for Shellshock. If you replace the word attack with a command that you want to execute on your victim's system, that's all it takes. That simple. Like it's like seven characters, eight characters, right? Like super quick and off you go. What happens is the bad guy sends that command, attack, and then your data gets shoved back to him. 
Very easy. This is why it was a 10-10. I will show you that in action, okay? This is my website. It's Mark's Marvelous Market. Um, it is running a very simple contact form. That form is back-ended by an older technology, um, CGI bin, which is Computer Gateway Interface. I'm just going to make sure this is still running. Um, computer Gateway Interface. And what that is, is that takes the form and then it executes, it takes that data and it executes a command on the shell. As an attacker, I'm going to enumerate this application and find a vulnerable point. Manually, I'm going to look at the source code for that HTML page and I notice in the form that the action is CGI bin submit. I now have the first piece of information I need to run an exploit. I know a full URL that I can ping that should execute a command on the server. Normally, that's submitting this form so that somebody who runs the market can respond to a customer. I'm a bad guy. I'm not going to use it that way. I'm going to flip over, ironically, to bash and run a command. That command is sending a web request to that URL with our attack code, and I'm dumping all of the users on the system. This is bad. This should not happen. Should not happen with one command. I'm going to get a little more evil, and what I'm going to dump is part of the Apache web server config. And what I'm going to dump is the location of the SSL certificate. Also, very bad. It should never happen, and it should not be one command. I'm going to be even more mean, and I'm actually going to dump the entire private key for that certificate. Now I have both the public key, because shockingly it's public, and I have the private key. What that allows me as an attacker is to execute a man-in-the-middle attack. So I can get between your legitimate users and your website with your cryptographic identity, and nobody knows. So I'm signing requests legitimately. They think I'm you, and you think I'm them, and I get all the data. Everyone thinks it's encrypted. It is encrypted, except I'm in the middle with valid encryption keys for both sides. Right? Very simple exploit, very dramatic impact. Literally took three commands, and you could probably guess it in one, because most people leave the certificates in pretty default positions. Anyone disagree that this is really bad? Right? That, that's atrocious. So let's see just actually how bad this was. And this is where it gets fun, and this is why this is one of my absolute favorite vulnerabilities of all time. So are there any guesses at how long or when this first entered the public sphere, when this bug was released into Bash? Any guesses? Wild guesses? Like 15 years ago. 15 years? OK. Anybody else? 20, OK. Anyone else? Solid guesses. Solid guesses. I'll give you kudos. 1989, OK? Not the Taylor Swift album, not the Ryan Adams cover of the Taylor Swift album, the year, 1989. What also happened in 1989, I think Paula Abdul had like two hits on the top 10. Also, Game Boy was the top of the line mobile gaming system of the day. Right? This is a bad thing. It's been around for a really, really long time. So you think initially in 1989, not that big of an impact, because not much was connected. But all through the dot-com boom, this bug was live. Right? And for every time the good guys know about a bug, I will guarantee that the bad guys have also known about it, and we're just nice and quiet about it, quietly exploiting it, doing what they wanted with it. So 1989. So we have that at the top of the table here. 1989 in August, uh, August 5th, 832 was when it was first checked into the code base. Got to love source control. You get really accurate stats like this. 27 days later, they actually rolled it up into a release and shoved it out to the public. There it sat for 9,141 days. 25 years. For 25 years, this sat out in the ecosystem, live, making people vulnerable to this exploit. Whether they were exploited or not, that's another question. You can see after the initial report, two days later, we had the first patch. And then, this is what I talked about as far as there's a sequence, there's an event here. It's not just one isolation, it's an entire process. All of these points in this table are things that you, as people who are running applications at, uh, workloads, need to respond to. This is either instances where there's more information, worse yet, they found out it was not just the bad as they thought, it was worse than they thought and there's alternate ways to exploit this bug. So this bug went beyond simple web requests. We saw, started to see it in DHCP, in DNS, and a whole bunch of other stacks had similar exploits off of this one pivot. So each of these points, you had to do something. You had to be aware, you had to read the information, you had to make a risk assessment, or if they were green, you actually had to deploy a patch. 
So a zero day is not just one event, it's a sequence of events. And this took case, uh, place over a uh, course of two weeks. If we roll that up, you can see here we had five patches. We had to deploy five patches to fix this one issue that had sat live for 25 years. Ironic, a sense of urgency at the end of the process after it had laid fallow for so long. But nonetheless, we need to react to that, right? Because as soon as we're aware of it, you do not want to go back to your boss or to the board and say, yeah, we were aware of it, but you know, it had been out there for 25 years, so we just kind of didn't do anything. And then we dealt with it later. And I'm sorry we made the front page and that you were photographed like looking like an idiot, walking out, not knowing that all your data had leaked. So you have to respond to all these events. And that kicks off the two-phase process. We need to react, and that's the first thing. Something hits this, and we need to start this reaction, right? And then we need to resolve it. So let's dive into how we react. And we're going to go back to our shared responsibility model. There's two ways we're going to react. The first part, we're going to look, and we're going to verify our AWS configuration. And then I'm going to take a quick break and give you an ironic statement on my part, is that you should never agree to do a talk that you have to prep a month in advance when you know there's a reInvent keynote where they're going to announce new stuff. Yeah. And I'll show you how the new stuff that was announced this morning actually ties into this process. But I'll show you the manual way, and then I'll show you the really easy way. So this is a design out of the AWS Reference Architecture Library. For those of you who don't know, AWS has a reference architecture library. AWS.com or AWS.Amazon.com slash architecture. This is the standard web application hosting architecture. It's basically what we'd call an N-tier architecture. Right, so you've got a presentation layer, a business layer, and a database backend. I'm going to clean this up a little bit because we're only worried with part of it. We're going to eliminate Route 53, CloudFront, S3, all that kind of stuff. And we're going to see our core of our deployment is an elastic load balancer, a set of instances, an elastic load balancer, then another set of instances. Okay, when we flatten that out, it looks like this. So we have traffic coming in. It hits the first elastic load balancer. It then goes to a series, uh, to an instance that's running in one of two subnets across availability zones. That instance will then talk to another load balancer that does the same thing on the back end. So you've got presentation layer, so your UI, your web servers, then your business logic in the back end, right? Very simple, very standard uh, deployment method. We've been doing this for years. This is well before cloud. It just works a lot better when we're in the cloud. So what we need to do is make sure that what we've designed on paper or on PowerPoint is actually what we have in our deployment in AWS. Is this what's actually running in our VPC? And to do that, we're going to go through an auditing checklist. And AWS has a white paper. It's really good. I'll reference it in a second. But the first thing we need to do is check our IAM permissions. We want to make sure that the instances in our deployment don't have permissions that they shouldn't. Because if they are compromised, we don't want the attacker to start to go sideways and affect the rest of our resources. So here we look at we have an IAM role that has no permissions. This is a good operational practice to give everything a role because you can't give it a role after it's been instantiated. After it's up and running, it either has a role or doesn't. You can change the permissions, but you can't give it a new role. So in our case, we've given it a role, but it can't do anything. This means if an attacker compromises our system, they're not going to go out and delete a bunch of stuff in our AWS account. This is a good thing. We're safe here. Next thing we want to check is our security groups. We have four security groups. One for the outer load balancer, the next set of instances, the next load balancer, the next set of instances. We're going to check to make sure that the rules aren't too generous. The first rule we have is for our outbound uh, ELB, for the internet-facing one. It's open to the world. It's a good thing. The next one is our web servers. They're also open on TCP for, port 443, which we expect to be HTTPS traffic. They're also open to the world. That's bad. They shouldn't be. The reason why they shouldn't be is because they're sitting behind a load balancer. The only person talking to those instances should be that load balancer, right? This is a very common mistake. It's very simple. It makes sense when you think about it. But then you're like, oh, wait, load balancer. Load balancer is the one talking to them, not the other. So we're going to actually go in and fix this rule. And we're going to use a little trick that not too many people are aware of. We're going to edit the source to change it to actually be another security group. Most people assume you can only dump uh, IPs or IP address blocks in there. You can actually put in security groups. So here we've chained two security groups. Sorry, All good. There's a limit on the number of security groups. There is. There is a limit, and I'll get back onto that one for sure. So in this case, we've got a simple design, and we're not going to hit that limit. But what we've done is we've linked a security group to a security group. So we've said the load balancer is the only person to allow to send traffic to the next layer, which is the web instances. Now we're going to check the next, uh, the next load balancer. And here what we see is we see that both of our 
public subnets are allowed to send traffic. This is not bad. This is pretty decent. But operationally, it's cumbersome. It's clunky. Because what if we stand up a third subnet in another availability zone? Right? Then we'd have to go in and add another rule and another rule and another rule and another rule. Far more efficient is to do the same trick, link the security groups again. Because now we're saying anyone who's a web instance is allowed to talk to the internal ELB. So finally, we're going to then check our application server. And our application server is probably going to be OK. Sometimes I get a little ahead of my videos. But the gentleman's earlier point about security group limits, there are limits on almost everything in AWS. Sometimes you hit them, sometimes you don't. In standard type of deployments like this, you're probably not going to hit them that often. Um, it's not that big of a concern. Some limits you can have request or increased on request. Others, like the security group limit, you actually can't get increased. But if you're in an edge case where your security groups are getting limited, you probably want to reevaluate how you've architected them. So our security groups check out. We move on to our next thing, which is our subnets. So these are network address space that we're using. And what we want to do here is we want to make sure that the routing tables, which is how traffic is directed, are set up so that our public subnets are public. In this case, they have an internet gateway. That's a good thing. But we want to make sure that the opposite is uh, also true for private subnets. We want to make sure that the private subnets don't have internet gateways in their routing tables. We've done that. We're OK here. That's always good. Now comes to the little more complicated. Network ACLs, NACLs, horrible acronym. Um, what they are is these define what comes in and out for the subnet. So security group goes for your instance. NACLs go for the subnet itself. Here, we've actually done a pretty good job. All traffic is allowed internally in our VPC. We're OK there. Um, going in and out of the VPC, we've set up some ephemeral ports. You don't have to understand these. You just have to know that these are aligned with AWS best practice because of the way some network protocols work. Right? You look at the range, and you're like, wow, why not just everything? Good question. I don't have a good answer for that. Um, so we've checked our knuckles. We're OK there. So in this process, what we've done is we've gone through and checked our AWS configurations. We've checked our IAM roles. They were OK. We had roles assigned, but they had no permissions. That means if there was additional permissions there, what could happen is an attacker gains a foothold, so they exploit our box like we saw in the first video, then they could go delete our backup. Or they could spin up new instances. Or they could keep doing whatever they wanted in our account if it had too many permissions. So we check our roles. We make sure they don't have extra permissions. We check the security group to make sure they were locked down as possible. And we did the same thing with our subnets and our knuckles. So I promised you tie into the keynote this morning. Uh, did everybody see the keynote with Andy Jassy this morning, right? AWS config rules. We saw that quick little blurb. AWS config rules can automate everything I just walked you through. You can set up an AWS config rule set to verify what we just checked manually, so that in the case when you have to react, you can simply go in and execute that rule set. And it will come back with a nice itemized list of yes, you're good, no, you're not, yes, you're good, no, you're not, all the way through. Fantastic service. It really makes AWS config extremely valuable. It's something you should look at. You should sign up for the preview and read the AWS blog post on it. Um, we've got a blog post up on it as well um, to understand how that works. So what you just walked through, the bottom line, you can automate that through config rules. Super powerful, really awesome. Interesting when you're giving a talk that's based on that, and then you got to incorporate it at the last minute. So that's part of it. That's the AWS side of things. What we need to check now is on our instances, because what we've got set up is assumed traffic flow. So we've used security groups and NACLs to make sure that we only have TCP 443 going in. What most people don't tend to realize is that while we expect secure web traffic, so HTTP traffic, uh, HTTPS traffic, excuse me, there is no guarantee currently in place to make sure that that's the actual traffic we expect. All of these ports are default by international de facto agreement. Um, IANO has a big port list of what the default port for services are, but they are simply default ports. So most of you probably have seen inside your organization, somebody's got a web server where you look at the domain and then it's colon and a new port number, right? Because they've picked a new port to run that server on. You can do that with the client side as well. I can send requests to wherever. So what we've verified in place right now is simply what we expect to be coming through. We expect secure web traffic to be coming through this. What we have to do, because we're security people and we're a little paranoid, is verify that that's actually what's coming down. And to, use that, to do that, we're going to use a control called intrusion prevention. What intrusion prevention does is it's going to look at each packet to verify that it is what we actually think it is. Very simple. So I'll give you a little animation to see that in action. We have one packet goes through. It's HTTPS. That's what we're expecting. We allow it to continue on. Next packet comes through. Same thing. It's valid, secure web traffic. We're happy with that. Off it goes. 
Somebody then tries to SSH into the box. That's not what we want, so we're gonna drop it. Right? It's pretty straightforward. A little more nuanced case. Somebody sends HTTPS traffic, but in this case, it contains a SQL injection attack. Well, we're gonna drop that too. That's the value of the intrusion prevention engine. It will know, it not only verify that the packets you're receiving conform to the protocol you're expecting, but they also don't have any malicious content. So we're gonna use that to protect against shell shock. So what we wanna do is we wanna deploy that on all of our instances. So this raises an interesting operational question. If you have a very large deployment, you could end up with a significant amount of individual security controls that you need to manage. So you wanna make sure that you can manage those either programmatically or centrally, otherwise you've just made a huge problem for yourself operationally, trying to configure and manage alerts from all these different systems. So you need some sort of centralization here. So let's watch that in action. Here we go with our uh, normal attack. We saw that attacker there. What we're gonna do now is flip over to our defensive tool and we're gonna apply a rule in our intrusion prevention engine to actually look for that attack code that we saw on that first slide. So now we're gonna configure our engine, we're gonna go in and we're gonna pick a rule, and we're gonna say we wanna prevent against this attack. So this is our deep security platform, but it works with any intrusion prevention. Uh, the technique will work uh, just fine. In this case, we're gonna pick uh, the remote code vulnerability, which equals to the same set of CVEs that we saw for uh, Shellshock. So this is what's gonna tell the engine that any time you see that fake function code and something piped after it to execute, drop that packet. No matter what, if it's a valid protocol, if it's coming over valid HTTPS traffic, if it contains that attack string or any mutation thereof, get rid of it. So if we flick back and put our bad guy hat back on, we try the exact same attack, you'll see our response is significantly different. In this case, we're receiving an empty reply from the server. Try it again just to see, but it's the exact same thing. What we've got here is an empty return from the server because the server is running intrusion prevention. It saw the attack, it was a valid packet, it conformed to what we expected, but it had an attack inside, so it had malicious payload, and it dropped it. So the attacker is no longer able to exploit it. So while we have not fixed the issue, we have at least mitigated it for now. So we bought ourselves time, okay? It's a very important step. So if we summarize what we've done on our side, we've checked that all of our instances are protected with a mitigation control, in this case, intrusion prevention. We've done some workload-specific rules. In this case, we deployed the Shellshock uh, rule set, and we're managing those all centrally. Again, update from this morning, with a security tool set that allows you to program it, so if it has an API or if it's got some scriptability, it can tie into AWS config rules as well. So everything we've just talked about for the last 20 minutes can boil down to one click for you as a response. You can go into AWS config rules, run that one rule set, have AWS report back the AWS configuration side and have your security tool report back what it's doing so that you can verify that you've got all the stuff you need in place in place. Awesome, love that. Still important to understand the concepts underneath, right? Just justifying spending 20 minutes of your time. But still, um, no, it is really important to understand those concepts. And that's one thing that holds true for all of your automation. Automation is what you need to be aiming for. You should be 100% automated or as close as possible, but you should still understand what that's doing under the hood. So we've reacted, but we bought ourselves time. We actually need to fix the problem. We've mitigated it, nobody's gonna pop our boxes, but we need to make sure that we're actually resolving this issue. And this ties down to a new, um, well, relatively newish technique for how we deploy things out. So we have our um, network, if we look at the flattened diagram again, we've got our, our instances, we've got our ELBs, we've got intrusion prevention running on those instances. But we create these instances somehow, right? So you either uh, bake AMIs or you're configuring them on the fly. Just out of curiosity, how many people create AMIs? Yeah, and how many people configure on the fly with something like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, SaltStack? That's what I figured, it's about 50-50. Right? And I'm sure there's a bunch of people who do both, right? Um, so that gives us the ability. So when we look at how we create these things, now, because we're in AWS, we're no longer constrained like we were in the data center. In the data center, if you want to spin up new instances, you have to worry about capacity. In AWS, that's a different capacity question where does your account have sufficient limits? Normally, yes. Do you have enough budget? Normally, yes. So what we can do is what's called a blue-green deployment or green-blue deployment. There's no real standard. Everyone's flipping, flopping back and forth. So blue-green deployment is very, very simple. In principle, what you do is you have, let's say, blue, that is your current production. Okay, so here we have an elastic load balancer, we've got our instances, they are in production, they are servicing our users. These are the ones that we just walked through where we've mitigated the attack with our intrusion prevention engine. So we know they're safe for now, 
but they still have an issue underneath that needs to be patched. So now in a completely new area, so in a new VPC or new subnets or a new group, however you want to set it up, we are going to spin up a new instance. And we're going to implement a change. So in this case, we're going to deploy our patch. So we're going to fix the actual problem. Then, very, very important, we're going to test. We're going to make sure that that works and also that that didn't break anything else. Okay? So we've deployed our patch. We make sure our app still works. We make sure that the instance still behaves how we expect it to behave. And then at this point, you can either bake a new AMI and then instantiate off of that, or you can then promote these ones that are fixed up into production. So in this case, we add them to the ELB, and now we let the connections drain over, right? We noon traffic goes to the green deployment while we drain out the blue so that users are still uh, getting service. And this way, we've done it so that there's no downtime. Okay, so what we've done is we've taken an existing environment that was servicing users, it was uh, handling requests. We've created and repaired a new environment, and we're moving our traffic over. So either with an ELB or with DNS, you can do the same thing. And then what we do is then we destroy the old ones. We destroy the blue ones. We tear them down. Okay, so we've just kind of done like a little bit of the shell game. We've moved people over to where things are better. That's blue-green deployment. Everyone gets that concept in general? Good. Okay. So we've got that in place. We've got intrusion prevention. We can spin up new instances, but things change. So as you have an instance up and running, okay, it's up and running, and it's going to change over time. As much as we would like to have immutable infrastructure and everything in a container, things like that, things will change over time. We have cache files. We have temporary files. You're writing some data to disk. What you need to do is make sure that you're monitoring those for changes as well. Okay? So we're looking for layers upon layers of controls here to make sure that if we see something go, that we can react to it. So in this case, we're going to use a control called integrity monitoring. And what this does is it looks at changes as they're happening on the system. Okay? And we're going to have a rule set here that says what a bad change is. So in our case, we could look at it and say, you know, anything in the temp file, we're okay with that. Anything that happens in the wisdom, uh, Windows System 32 directory, we know that's bad. Right? Because we're only patching in our green deployments. In our blue deployments that are in production, we know none of that stuff should change. Same thing for your application code. You know your application code shouldn't change in production. It changes in your green deployment, and you move it over. So anytime we see a change that we know should never logically happen, then we raise up an alert, and we can react to it. Okay? And ideally, you automate that reaction as well. So that's how integrity monitoring works. So we're going to see that in action here. What we're going to do is create a rule that will stop a rather malicious use of Shellshock, which we saw in the wild. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to monitor the integrity of my SSH key material. So SSH is a secure way to log into a Linux instance, right? And in this case, what you'll see here in the Shellshock attack is I'm actually writing new SSH keys. So I'm allowing myself as an attacker to log into your instance directly so I don't have to keep going around. And what we've done is we do this a few times. I keep writing my keys and the keys of my buddies so that we now own your instance and can do whatever we want. Then we flip back to our tool, and we see that we're going to raise and we're going to have an alert that says, hey, somebody fired something that triggered this rule, right? So they made changes to our key material, and they've changed that uh, authorized key file on our instance. That is a bad thing by the way. That should never ever happen in production. And ideally, you're shooting towards the goal where nobody actually logs into any instances in production. Right? You're trying to get to the point where everything in production is as stable and as uh, unchanging as possible. Right? You want it as immutable as possible. So that's how we can do it with integrity monitoring. We can look at that. And this all kind of ties back into our resiliency. So we've seen a few different ways to leverage AWS. We've seen a few different ways to leverage third-party controls. Yep. What, would it make sense to, when you see it, would it make sense to automate just rolling back that change? It can, for sure. However, what you need to verify is what is more efficient. So the question was, would it make sense to automate rolling back a change? So you had a trigger alert said, hey, there's a change on this instance. Would it make sense to roll that back? Sometimes, yes, it does. More often than not, what makes sense is to destroy that instance. Because if you're living in an auto-scaling group and most of your stuff should be in auto-scaling groups, um, a new one will come back that you know is good. So it's a question of do you repair or do you just replace? So that would be the, that would be the response trigger then? Yeah. 
Absolutely. So he asked if that would be the response trigger. That would absolutely be the response trigger. Um, so it leads to this interesting question. And, and even so, some people I kind of I got together when I said everything should be an auto scaling group. One thing you should be aware of auto scaling groups don't actually need to scale. Right? They are named auto scaling, which is great. It implies very quickly what it does. But auto scaling groups can have a min and a max of one, which means at any point, if that one instance fails that health check for the auto scaling parameter that you've set, it will be replaced, which is an extremely powerful way to make sure that you're always up and running. You'll have a little bit of downtime because there's only one system there, but it's a good way to make sure that you're always bouncing back. And that's a fantastic example, the baseline of automating that resilience. So in the old days, you would sequester the box, yep. replace it, go back on line, and then take the sequestered box out for, uh, for instance. Mm -hmm. There is. So the question was, um, in the old days, we would take a box offline, we would isolate it, and then do some analysis afterwards and restore production if we could. Um, is there an equivalent in the cloud? There absolutely is. So what you can do in this response trigger is as soon as you have security events and you're responding to them, so AWS Lambda is a fantastic way to do these kind of responses uh, because you can give Lambda privileges to take action. So as long as your security control set is firing off events and is automated to do some response, you can start these triggers. So that exact scenario of isolating something, if we saw that integrity change, somebody changed our code for our app. Could be an innocent mistake. Happens all the time. Somebody accidentally rolls a new version, shouldn't have. Could also be an attacker making a malicious change. What you would do in this case is you would fire off a response that would isolate that instance if you wanted to do analysis, which would then trigger your auto-scaling group to automatically replace it, which means production's taken care of, and you have that instance sitting isolated that you could analyze if you want to, um, or you could just destroy it and not worry about it because you've already fixed the problem. The only caveat there is you have to make sure that you don't have that loop, always isolating instances, and have this long trail of stuff that's running that you're never actually going to analyze. So you want to put a cap of isolate one or two, maybe, but you don't want to isolate 1,000 as it just keeps looping and going forward. <laughs> you haven't gotten to the root cause, exactly. So. Yeah. And so the question or the comment was, you haven't gotten to the root cause. You could have an instance that spins up, and then it gets popped, and then a new one popped. And that's actually a really good example of something positive. Uh, because you've automated the response and are trying to restore production, what you've essentially done is stop the attacker at the gates. So you're playing that hand game where on the bat, where you're always trying to get higher. But you've bought yourself time, because the attacker's not getting any deeper. And now you can actually do a different response. So in that case, what you're going to do, if you see that where your automated response continues to respond and is not actually stopping because the attacker is persistent, then what you need to do then is manually intervene. But at least you know they haven't gotten any further. So you well, still get ahead. And you also have information, some information about how they're actually getting in. Absolutely. So So the, the comment, just for those in the back, was that you also gain additional information during that process. So you not only gave an information about how they're attacking, but also that they are continuing to attack, or at least they've set up some sort of automated attack method. And for Al, the longer you delay them, the more you learn about how to mitigate the issue, how to resolve the root cause, but also about who's actually attacking you. So it is, it's a win-win, right? You're not going to lose anything by trying that automation. And that comes back to our core of creating these resilient deployments. You want to make sure that you've got this automated. And yes, it's not a panacea. There's still challenges. Yeah? Absolutely. So the comment was on if you're doing logging correctly. So that ties into some additional services that were announced this week. Um, so uh, for those of you, uh, how many people this is their first reInvent? Awesome. That is fantastic. I love it. OK. So the thing to know about reInvent, the insider heads up, is that there is a lot of stuff that gets released in the week before, the week after, and the week during that never makes the keynote. So if you follow the AWS blogs or follow Jeff Barr online, you're going to see a huge amount of information um, of services or features that didn't quite make it to the keynote but are still really, really cool. So last week, there was a whole bunch of new stuff announced that never got uh, highlighted this morning. Um, so one of those features was actually tied into logging. Um, so the comment was around, if you're logging correctly, you're going to gain additional information. You're going to see what's going on. You gain general awareness of what's, uh, how your uh, deployment is reacting to the attack and what's going on in the attacker. And again, this ties back to our central theme, using the services of AWS Cloud to get better at security and to get a more resilient deployment. Um, but one of the services that came out was actually the uh, affected cloud trail. 
So um, again, I'll just show our hands. How many people know about CloudTrail? Awesome. You guys are awesome. This is great. Um, the reason why I say that's fantastic is a lot of people didn't know about it last year. Um, and it was in the early stages. But CloudTrail is a service that logs every uh, interaction with the AWS APIs. So whether somebody did it through the CLI, um, through a third-party tool, through the management console, all of it gets logged into LogTrail. For security people, LogTrail is a goldmine because you know every action that's being taken on your AWS account. So if we tie back to the earlier example where if you had had too many permissions on the instance role so that the attacker got on your instance and was then going out into your AWS account, you would see all that activity on CloudTrail. So one of the services that was, or one of the features that was released um, this week uh, was that you now have the ability to encrypt CloudTrail logs as they're written so that you know that they are uh, not tampered with, which is an excellent way, if you mess up on the permission side, to know that your logging information is still valid. Because the, what it ends up being with attackers is it's a cat and mouse game, right? So the vast majority of attackers will exploit something simple like shell shock. Um, so if they have a super advanced exploit, they don't need to deploy it if they can pop something really simple. You saw the attack code in the intro, it's very easy, you go through. And there is still a massive amount of systems that are actually vulnerable to this a year later, right? Average patch time right now for traditional enterprises is 176 days, okay? 176 days, because in an enterprise, it's extremely difficult to do something like a blue-green deployment. In an enterprise, you are more likely, in a traditional on-premise uh, on deployment, you're far more likely to try to resolve the issue on, an, on a computer rather than just spin up a new instance. And that comes back to what we're talking about, is leveraging things in AWS Cloud, features and functionality in AWS Cloud to get better at security. One of the biggest things you can do to help yourself on that front is start to think of your instances as disposable. If you need a new one, you make a new API call. If you need 10 new ones, you still make one API call, right? They come back up and uh, are running very, very quickly. Um, you don't have to fix the issue. So while it's interesting to dive in and do the forensic analysis and see how the attack is there, if the attack is a one and done, they try to uh, exploit your system and they can't get in and they move on, there's no reason to dive in and do that analysis uh, for you if they never got in. Yeah, but most of the time it's the QA team or somebody. If you have the resources, it's, you can always learn something and you can always improve. But if your compute was never compromised, then you can continue to move on. And that leads to another different way of thinking it, um, to reduce overall business risk. So if you're running anti-malware controls on your instance, and there's a malware event detected, and it reports back and it says, I found it, I quarantined it, I removed it, you don't have to worry about it. In a traditional environment, you'd be like, that's great, it did its job. In the AWS cloud, you can simply destroy that instance and bring up a new one. Why would you do that? Why would you not? Why leave any potential risk there when it costs another few pennies to spin up a second instance while the two are running, right? Because the compute level is disposable. That sounds really weird, but when you start to think in that manner, you start to get these advantages and be, enable your business to be a lot more secure, a lot more flexible, right? Different way of approaching it, different tool set, same things, right? Like an instance is still an operating system running an app, running data. We've had that for years. But backing it, I don't have to figure out if I have additional VMware capacity. I don't need to know if I have additional physical boxes. I have essentially unlimited capacity. So I can start to do interesting things like that. So for us, that comes back to the resiliency. You want to make sure that you've got automated response in here. Auto scaling is a major piece of this. But it also comes into services like Config, like Lambda, like SNS. So as you grow with familiarity with the cloud, you can start to build in these automated chains. Um, if you guys follow me uh, on Twitter, Mark NCA, I've got a bunch of examples of videos where we show those type of automated response models um, and how you can start to grow them really simple and expand from there. But it is very powerful. It's a different way of approaching security. So to summarize, to bring this back, and then we'll open the floor for complete questions if you guys want to chat. Um, it comes down to two phases when you're responding and when you're building in uh, resiliency into your deployment uh, against zero days and against just normal IT operation errors as well. It applies equally to those type of things as it does to malicious actors. You need a phase where you're reacting. So operationally here, you're reviewing your configuration, right? So we walked through that. We looked at the AWS configurations, so the services we can configure. We checked our IAM roles. We checked our security groups. We checked our network segmentation. We went through all of those piece by piece. 
Thankfully, as of this morning, we can do that automated with config rules. We can uh, make that significantly easier. And the beauty of things like config rules, guess what? They're all exposed by APIs as well, which means you can automate that review and just have your entire infrastructure respond and say, yeah, there was a problem. Don't worry about it. We fixed it. You'll get there. It takes a little while. Um, we also added a real-time control to make sure that what we expected on those ports that we'd configured through our network configurations and security groups was actually running what it was. So that's intrusion prevention. That's where we're looking at each packet and ensuring that it conforms to the protocol we expect so that it is actually running HTTPS. But then in addition to that, that it doesn't have any uh, malicious payloads. So for our case with Shellshock, we made sure that it didn't have that attack code or any permutation thereof. Right? So we did two steps to React. We reviewed our config, and then we made sure that we had intrusion prevention deployed and looking for that type of exploit. Right? That's how we react. That buys us time. That's the important takeaway there. Reacting buys us time to actually fix the issue. We do the root cause and we fix it. Right? So here we're looking at operational techniques like deploying in uh, blue-green. So we have our production. It stays. We don't change it. Spin up new instances in an isolated area where you can make the change, test the change, then either bake a new AMI or, and then instantiate that one or move production, uh, or just leave it as is, sorry, and then move production over. Using that technique, you can do a zero downtime fix, right? So you think about Windows. How often does a Windows patch reboot Windows, right? All the time, it's inevitable. It's just like, oh yeah, you installed a patch, you changed like a graphic, we're gonna reboot. It's just built into that culture. It's getting better, but it's still bad. With the blue-green, those reboots don't matter because the reboot happens on the ones that are not serving customers, right? Because you've mitigated with intrusion prevention during the React phase. You've mitigated the issue. You've bought yourself time to fix it over here. You can reboot a 1,000 times. It doesn't matter. Once it's ready, then you move production workflows over to there, draining out the old ones in blue, and you're up and running. Further, take that a step further. The real-time control response there is integrity monitoring. That's going to be looking for changes for files and processes to make sure that whatever's changing on your instance is the normal expected change. So you're seeing caching, you're seeing temp files, whatever your normal data writing is, you're seeing log files, things like that. But as soon as it finds something that it doesn't expect, so Windows System 32 changes or user bin local changes, things like that, then it raises an alert and then you can react to it and kick off this whole cycle again. Okay? So you're going to react you're going to resolve. Thank you. Follow me on Twitter, Mark NCA. Um, I'll open it up for questions. And if nobody wants to do public questions, we can do private as well. So we can do both. Any direct questions? Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, please remember. Thank you. Please remember to complete your evaluations. There's stations out there. If you're playing the social game on mobile, you actually get points for doing evals.